way to answer that question. Um, the shortest way to answer that question is to tell you the truth. And the truth is that my first job sucked. It was awful. It was a terrible experience. I hated going to work every day. Uh, and I couldn't reconcile that this was supposed to be the rest of my life, that I now had to resent the reason that I had to get out of bed every morning. And this job was a job I took when I was really young. I was 18 years old, fresh out of school, and it planted a really important seed for me that there had to be a better way. And long story short, I applied for a job at a company, company called Missing Link, which was known to have an exceptional culture, be a great place to work. I knew nothing about what the company did and I had none of the skills to actually work there, but I knew they had a great culture and I wanted to experience that and managed to get into Missing Link. And while I was working there, proved my theory that work doesn't have to suck. It's entirely possible to have a great experience as an employee and do amazing work. The company wins, the people wins, the, the people win and the clients, the clients win. Um, that led me to founding my first employee experience design consultancy. I then partnered with a guy by the name of Brad Shawkin. Brad and I merged our two separate businesses into our then business, Still Human. Still Human was all about making work not suck for people. And everything that we did as Still Human was centered around making sure that people were being switched on and grown and not switched off and depleted at work. And that is exactly what I've dedicated my career to doing. Um, I left, I moved from South Africa where I founded these two businesses to Amsterdam in 2021. And at that point made the decision to exit Still Human. And I can talk more about how the remote work stuff happened and the kind of the origin story of the remote work stuff in a bit. But essentially, when I left South Africa, I made the decision to exit Still Human and go internal to a company and roll up my sleeves, get really stuck into the remote work stuff. And that's how I find myself here, making work not suck for people remotely. That's great. And so how did you uh, end up participating in the Semco Style Expert program? How did I end up participating? Uh, this guy by the name of Christian approached me on LinkedIn, uh, connected with me and said, hey, this may be super interesting. You're in a very unique position as a remote work manager. Um, we think that some of the practices and principles of the Femco style would be really relevant and could really well be applied and help companies work remotely. Let's have a conversation. And so Christian, you and I had a conversation as it turns out, by complete coincidence, if coincidences exist, uh, Ricardo Semler, the founder of Semco and the originator of the Semco style, he wrote a book called Maverick. And that was actually one of the first business books that I'd ever read. So when Christian opened up the conversation about Semco style with me, it obviously really resonated because I was already a Ricardo Semler fan. And so participating in the Semco Style Expert Certification Program was an absolute no-brainer for me. That was a huge coincidence, right? That Well, I don't know about coincidence, but really that, okay, yeah, The Maverick it was the first business book that you read. So uh, needless to say that, you know, Semco Style resonated with you. Um, I wanted to make sure we, we, we gonna, we're going to kind of able to apply some of the simple style with your uh, with your work um i wanted to put out some questions though as well for the audience just to kind of get your guys's uh, insights you know and one of the questions we have for you are what are challenges and opportunities that you're currently experiencing with your team and your organization uh, and then we'll we we'll also want to speak to this um and we want to really also situate andy's particular situation as a fully remote uh, work manager right to see okay what what can you what have you all figured out that might help the more 
traditional companies, you know, transition to a more hybrid model, or you know, to, to even even potentially consider being fully remote. Um, I see that, um, Kristen, there's a question from Frankia in the chat, which I'm happy to happy to address. <laughs> Frank, it's a great question. Um, what I did earlier in my life that sucked, I mean, the job was, the, what I was doing was just working in a retail store. What sucked was the way that we were treated by the managers and the store owners. Um, we were belittled. We had no freedom of choice. There was no, it was very much a situation of please don't use your brain, just do things the way we tell you, how we tell you to, uh, because we know best. And that's what sucked about it, because as a free thinking individual, it was really hard to show up into an environment where I was asked to please not think, please not have an opinion every single day. So Frank, I hope that that answers your question. Frank, I quit. <laughs> that, was, that was fast. Okay, yep. clear answer, thanks. Well, let me ask you all this, right? Quitting is one way, right? What if you don't maybe have that option? And like maybe to, to, to feel this for, for Eliza, right? You've been looking at what companies can do and why is it really important for organizations to figure this remote hybrid work? Why is it important to figure this out? Well, it comes down to trust or lack thereof. So when when company when organizations or even managers, supervisors, executives, leaders, it's one thing to be to show their vulnerability and say, "Look, this is an experiment. I, we're." We're figuring this out together. And there's another whole other side to it. Or I'm, I'm seeing some companies go that way and say, look, okay, this is this is experimentation, folks. Like we're in this together. Let's let's figure this out. Let's figure out how to make this work. You know, moving into, and this is usually for moving into hybrid, um, especially post-pandemic or you know, in the stage of the pandemic that we're in right now. What I'm also seeing is company organizations, companies, the executives are saying, okay, we're going to move to hybrid, but, um, and, and, you know, sort of giving sort of, sort of dictating what's going to happen. And there's even that one step further of, of actually saying, yeah, this isn't working at all, you know, having people, um, you know, either asynchronous or synchronous, but but having that hybrid situation, I want people in the office three days a week minimum. If you wanna be, if you wanna work from home, you can do it for two days. And, and we're seeing this now come out, more and more companies are switching to saying, yeah, working more at home as opposed to coming into work, being seen face to face, is uh, is a problem, and because there's this idea of bums and seats, I keep coming back to it over and over. There's this, there's it's it's like tunnel vision. Like we, I, I, for me to know my per, my people are working and achieving our goals, what we need to do, uh, I need to see them doing it, and and you know without without them being here and for me to see them and for them to be interacting with each other in person, um, it, it, this isn't working. So uh, some companies are even going to so far as to implement surveillance methods to, to figure out if they're really working in the home piece of the hybrid. So why is it important to have a plan so it's not chaos? Because chaos takes away trust, it takes away, um, it, it just makes it a chaotic situation, which people generally don't like. Um, but if you introduce it as experimentation, that's very different. It definitely maintains a good amount of trust. And if you're not going the surveillance route, again, much better. Um, your employees are not going to be happy with surveillance techniques being used on them because there's no trust then 
you, you can't say that there's trust and also use um, surveillance techniques. So do I answer your question, Christian? That was a bit of a, <laughs> I don't know, rant. Uh, <laughs> It was trying to be an overview, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Little jokes here. Ah, yeah. Oh, so. Can you guys see my screen right now? Yep. Yeah. So these are just some two little little you know cartoons that reflect, I think, a lot of the current vibe that that at least I get from people wanting uh, others to be back in the office, and. You know, I think the question is, why do you want to have people in the office? Um, is it is it ego? Is it lack of planning? Right? Is is it that 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 from the management side? And um, Andy will give us a nice little overview of some of the of some of the things that she has done. And I wanted to just uh, give you guys a, a little bit of a map before we talk about this, right? Semco style has a framework that's based uh, on the practice and we created the theory afterwards, right? Semcoy has iterated over the three decades to really create a, a freedom-based workplace. You know, Semcoy has abolished the headquarters in the eighties, right? And to your point, Eliza, the trust is really what the Semcoy style is founded on, right? And you see then each of these principles has different pillars. For example, trust is really based on treating adults as adults, uh, striving to have unfiltered transparency, and in also reducing the power distance, right? And so we have different elements that really work well in terms of uh, enabling hybrid workplaces, remote workplaces. And as we kind of look at what, what Andy has done, uh, uh, understand that this there's a, a, a method to the madness behind it, right? Where you can really have some theoretical foundation of why should we do certain things and what can we do, right? We have over 100 different practices and then uh, experts such as Andy and Eliza take this and, and customize it to the organization that they work with. So, Andy, I'm curious, maybe for, for you as well, uh, the, the same question I just asked Eliza, right? Why, why is it important for organization to really figure this out with the remote hybrid work? Uh, you know, what do you see in, in that, from that perspective? What I see is chaos and a lot of disengagement from people and a lot of confusion. Uh, I was thinking to myself just before we jumped onto this call, how bizarre and timely it is that we're having this conversation today because when I was I was in South Africa today three years ago when we entered into our first hard lockdown and for us in South Africa that was when the entire country went remote like companies that were saying remote work was impossible were suddenly like okay we're gonna do this thing because we have no other choice and Christian I think the reason I say that is because three years later, we can't pretend that that didn't happen. The employees that you had and the human beings that you had working in your business pre-March 2020 are not the people who popped out the other side of it. And for various reasons, never mind the fact that we all just lived through this massive global thing that was kind of scary and kind of chaotic and disrupts on its own level. but. We've all proven that we can work from home. We just did it and we can't pretend that didn't happen. And the other thing that I think a lot of companies are being, what's the word I'm looking for? I suppose haphazard about is we're not considering the fact that co-located where everybody comes to the same office every day is one business operating system. Fully remote where nobody goes to an office every day is an entirely different business operating system. And hybrid is not the best of both worlds. I would argue that hybrid is the worst of all worlds. Because with hybrid, you're perpetuating two different employee experiences. You've got the people who come to the office every day, the people who come every now and then, possibly some people who never come. There's three different employee experiences that are happening. And whilst, yes, it's entirely possible to create a great hybrid workplace, don't kid yourselves. 
that it's the hardest one to do. But at the same time, calling everybody back to the office full time because hybrid is hard is probably going to result in the loss of a lot of key talent because people found freedom and autonomy and they reprioritize their lives. And yes, you're probably hearing the same sing song over and over and over again about autonomy, freedom, people reprioritizing. But that's because it's true. And we might not like it. That's fine. We don't have to like it. But that doesn't mean we can pretend it doesn't exist. So, uh, Christian, I think that's the, the big thing for me is understanding that these are different business operating systems. We can't just take, this is the way we always did things, co-located. Now let's try and do them remote. It doesn't work that way. And, and knowing, knowing what matters to you, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I have a question, I guess I'll jump in with. Um, so what in your, what do you think about leaders in terms of what differentiates a leader who can handle hybrid or remote and someone who can't? Do you think, that, can you kind of compartmentalize? And oh, that's think? such a juicy question. Um, willingness is the first thing. Any, and I suppose the question, I would take your question one step further back and say, are the people who are leaders actually trained to lead? Or are they just people who've been put in positions of leadership and told that you now lead people? Because those are two fundamentally different things. And I have a core belief that no human being should ever be placed in a position of leadership without adequate training. It's like putting you in the seat in the cockpit of a jumbo jet or an Airbus A380 and saying, yeah, please fly this thing. Without adequate training, you're going to crash and burn. And unfortunately, leading people, making sure people are being switched on and grown and not switched off and depleted is much the same thing. We're complex snowflakes as humans. We really are. And leading teams of people is infinitely more complex. So Coming to your question, I think it's really just, is, it the, is the leader willing to make this work? And to something you said, it's trust. If a leader trusts their people, they can work from anywhere and almost guaranteed achieve amazing things. If a leader doesn't trust their people, they can also work from anywhere. They can work from the office, they can work hybrid, or they can work remotely, and they're probably not going to achieve great things because those people are being switched off and depleted as opposed to being switched on and grown. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So maybe uh, along those lines, right, we, we see that Donald had made some comments in the chat as well that remote work highlights the managerial and leadership shortcomings that already exist before, right? And, and he also said, like, kind of like agile highlights issues that already exist in waterfall, right? I think the very, very uh, good point, Donald, right, that when, in a hybrid environment or remote environment, these shortcomings uh, tend to surface there. Well, uh, Andy, what what do you guys do in terms of leadership development for for uh, within Sastrify? So we have as a starting point what we call, <clears throat> excuse me, our leading remotely program, which is a leadership development program that I built for all of our leads, everyone from CEO to team lead, anybody who is a leader of people is required to do this training. And it's really just the fundamentals of leading remotely. Now, spoiler alert, the fundamentals of leading remotely are not overly different to the fundamentals of leading well. It's just that leading remotely comes with some nuances because we like to try and work asynchronously. We like to try and create documentation. We don't rely on spoken word or communication that's going to die as soon as we leave the room. Um, Christian, the, so that's the starting point, is what we wanted to create was a base, that every leader at Sastrify has the same lexicon, vocabulary, tools, skills, and mindset around what it takes to lead remotely. And that was, that's our, our first port of call was level the playing field. Let's make sure everybody has access to what they need. Let's set up our leads for success is another way of saying, 
of saying it. They have what they need to make sure that, again, people are being switched on and grown and not switched off and depleted remotely. Great, great. So that's that's interesting to have a, this common foundation, right? Um, one of the the, the, the practices that, that you shared um, was to treat adults as adults, right? And so th this one of the uh, our our pillars in in the, in the sample style. I'm curious, like how how do you all treat adults as adults? I think treat adults as adults might be one of my favorite phrases, practices, learnings to come out of my learnings with Samco style. And it's funny because Christian, this is actually, and this, I haven't actually even shared this with you, but this treat adults as adults has become standard vocabulary in my team now. I'm, I sit in Sastrify's people team and we're constantly coming back to let's just treat adults as adults. Let's not sugarcoat it. Let's not hide the hard stuff from them. Let's just share it like it is. Um, so one, I mean, there's, there's a couple of different ways that we've done this, but one of the ones that comes to mind is, um, and this covered, uh, yeah, I'll probably come back to this example um, a couple of times in this conversation, but we had, we use Slack like most companies. We had a couple of instances of people posting inappropriate, I will say content in our company-wide Slack channels, whether it was political or religious, and it's just not the place for those types for that type of content and the message came down the line that we wanted to create a set of rules for what could and could not be posted on slack and i was the person who was tasked with writing the rules for what can and cannot go on slack and i immediately pushed back and said i think this is a terrible idea why because our adults should be able to regulate themselves. Also, of 150 odd people, there's two or three people who are posting this contentious content. So let's not write up rules for 150 odd people that actually only apply to two people. Rather, let's create guidelines of what you should and what you shouldn't. And also let's just have a conversation with people and say, use good judgment, you know, just consider what you're posting and what the ramifications are going to be. And let's deal with those one or two people who are being problematic. Let's not keep letting them get away with it. Let's not slap it on the wrist. Let's call it out and say, hey, guys, this is not OK. You're an adult. I'm an adult. We're going to have an adult conversation about why this is not OK. And please behave better. And that's how we change habits and behaviors by creating that there's nowhere to hide, treating adults as adults. That's great, right? So to avoid creating a bunch of rules and just trust that people are making good decisions on their own, right? And maybe have some conversation with individuals about problematic behavior. Yeah. Right? And that's sometimes when we will talk a little bit about later on about bureaucracy, but typically that's that's a default reaction that we have to create more rules and uh, guidelines, etc. Uh, I see Frank has his uh, hand up, so I just wanted to see, if, uh, Frank, if you wanted to chime in here. Yes, um, I, I, I was thinking about what uh, what you mentioned about treating adults. As adults. Uh, I've worked with children for, for a few years, and, uh, um, and then I was inspired by a, a TED Talk video by Ken Robinson, and what I learned was, um, and it's also what I've experienced, that uh, children think extremely creatively. And as Ken Robinson explained, the more they go to school, the less creative they th creatively they think. So uh, to your point, I mean, what I thought about, what about treating children as children? So for example, um, you know, instead of, giving answers, asking them questions, or listening to them, or following their interests, or encouraging them to, to play and try new things out, et cetera. What are, what are your thoughts about that? 
Uh, I, personally, I love it. I love it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Works. <laughs> Why not? I think it's awesome. It's it's in the exact same vein as treating adults as adults. It's about meeting people where they're at, right? Um, trusting that it's not supposed to be perfect. It's actually supposed to be messy and experimental and things are, the apple cart is supposed to get upset along the way. But, and I think, you know, now that I'm thinking about it and I'm formulating my thoughts as I'm answering you, I think what I love about treating children as children and treating adults as adults is about meeting people where they're at. Mm. Let the children be children and let the adults be adults. And that comes with accountability and expectation. So, so why are we pushing people into this uh, command and control mindset? In schools, I, I, I view the command and control like, you know, lecturing that we do in schools, gymnasiums, universities, but also controlling like so many tests all over the place. Why, why are we doing it? It's a great question. And I think this group of people here today is asking the exact same question. I don't think we have the answer other than because that's the way we've always done things, which is not a good enough answer for why we should carry on doing it that way. But I don't know that any of us here can give you an answer for why are we doing it. I think we're all the people going, wait, there's a better way. So that's a good segue into one of our other pillars, which is alternative control. So how can leaders manage in a way that they feel in control without being overly controlling and providing and still being able to provide that freedom to employee? Do you have any insights or examples that you would you could share? The power of being in control without controlling is something that I think is in a remote work environment, such an incredibly important thing to focus on, but actually in any work environment, if you wanna give people freedom and autonomy and you wanna put the power back in the hands of people to do amazing things, how do you give them, you give them control, but at the same time maintain control? And this again is the rules thing, no need for excessive rules of you can't do this, you can't do this. Let's give people, let's draw the outlines of the playing field and let people play inside that field. Um, something that we recently did at Sastrify that's proven to be fascinating and has had some amazing knock-on effects is, so a lot of you may have seen what Shopify did with canceling meetings. You've, in the vein of remote work, probably heard a lot about working asynchronously, cancelling meetings, not spending all of our time in meetings, but rather trying to actively give people time back for deep focused work. And to do that, we need to not be spending all of our time in meetings. So Shopify created quite a buzz when they cancelled all meetings in the company. I think I stand to be corrected, but I think it was all meetings of more than two people were cancelled. They saved thousands of hours in people's calendars. But this was kind of it was something that was mandated from the top. Suddenly people's calendars were freed up. The problem was that the reason for that meeting was not being addressed. So the problems that needed to be solved were still problems that needed to be solved. So at Sastrify, we didn't want to take quite a quite such a gung-ho response to like, let's just cancel all meetings and see what happens. So we decided to rather look at what are the recurring meetings that happen in the business. And I firmly believe that you cannot change what you cannot see. So I wanted to give us numbers and visibility and visuals. So I created a tally um, of the recurring meetings that happened in the business and how much time per quarter each astronaut, because that's what we call ourselves, was spending in meetings. And once we'd done the maths, we realized that it was almost a working week per quarter per person that was being spent tied up in recurring meetings. That's a lot of time that people could be doing deep focused work that's spent in meetings. And this, instead of saying to people, let's cancel all meetings, what we rather did was created this tally, went back to our leads and said, 
here's the numbers, like here's the reality. What can you change about this? And Leeds elected to take updates, um, updates meetings and meetings where people generally just show up and listen rather than show up and contribute. A lot of our leads decided of their own volition to cancel those. They would just record the updates, upload them to our news bulletin, and people can interact with that content as and when it works for them. And what we've managed to do is we've brought that down all the way from almost 40 hours per person to somewhere under 10 at this point, 10 hours of recurring meetings per person per quarter. And that was our attempt at what one of our attempts at being in control, but without being controlling. So controlling the overall, how much time are people being sucked into meetings? How much time do people have for deep focused work? But letting the leads, treating adults as adults, letting the leads take control of it for themselves, empowering them in that process. Nice. Thank you. Have a question? Yes, I'm wondering, you know, if people have freedom, um, to what extent that will end up in chaos? Uh, so I worked in retail also, and um, what I experienced is, uh, for example, in a chain, in a chain of, of stores, um, I had the impression that the goal was that almost every store looks the same, you know, and um, so some kind of control was necessary, and I'm wondering. Does every store have to look the same? I mean, and even in a chain, could couldn't if, if people had some great ideas locally, you know, could they could they experiment and and, and what effect would that have on sales and, and profitability? What could possibly go wrong if you tried? Yeah, exactly. But but why why does it? I mean, why does why does every supermarket look more or less the same? And, why we're we not experimenting more there? Again, great question. The answer I would probably give you is bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Senseless bureaucracy, but bureaucracy nonetheless, because somebody decided that in our brand guidelines and in our look and feel, we have to be copy paste of each other. And on some level, I can understand that. There's a lot of comfort being able to go anywhere in the world, walk into a McDonald's and know that I'm in a McDonald's. Yeah. But that's not to say that if that particular McDonald's had some unique flavoring and the employees and the people there had made it feel like their home more, I would probably still know I was in McDonald's but it would probably be a more unique experience as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, but hey, it's worth a try. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> a question that's somewhat related um, that I keep thinking about is how, and maybe you have some lessons learned or some ideas about working asynchronous, asynchronously. How do you work asynchronously without it being chaos. So, you know, so we're talking a little bit about um, not command and control, you know, and, and, and providing a lot of freedom, but how do you do that, but also keep things moving and um, it will achieve your goals? Not email out in the open and have clear goals. Um, have clear goals, know the goals you're trying to achieve. Don't use email. Email is the original form of asynchronous communication. It is also the most chaotic. Email is not working asynchronously. Email is working poorly. Let me put it that way. Uh, and out in the open, work where everybody can see and everybody can follow the conversation. So your tools like Notion, Guru, Confluence, your knowledge management and documentation tools, that's where you want to be working asynchronously so everybody can see it and everybody can follow the conversation. Um, I am will be completely honest, I don't love any of those tools. I like aspects of all of them. I'm personally still waiting to find the documentation tool that is phenomenal and 
I believe works best for asynchronous remote working. Um, so I'll just put a pin in that. But in terms of asynchronous and how to work asynchronous better, one just start a work out in the open. So I'll give you an example. Um, our people and culture lead is currently on a leadership retreat in Ireland. Our people ops director is sitting at home in small Germany, in a small village in Germany. And I'm sitting in my apartment in Amsterdam. And our other people ops lead is sitting in Kentucky, USA. We're all working on different time zones. There's children to manage, there's schedules to manage, but we're collaborating on a presentation for an all hands meeting that needs to happen next week. The notes for what we wanted to share are in a Notion page. I create the Notion page and I say, hey, these are the points I wanna make. What do you think? All three of them can see those notes. They can come into that document at any time. We've agreed that we'll make a final decision on what's going into that, what, what information is being shared by X time on X day. And then I can go into the Google Slides and I can build the slide and I can tag all of them and say, hey, here's the slide. Please let me know if you want any changes. And we've collaborated on it from various corners of the planet. And that's how we build it. And that's asynchronous it's I, I will also say that I think we've built up asynchronous work to be this like big amazing thing that all remote companies or all companies should strive for we're all doing it anyway like it's like we really don't need to overhype asynchronous working yes there's nuances to getting it right and doing it well but we're all doing it anyway and we have been for a while. Every single time you have not replied to a text message immediately, or you've waited a couple of days to respond to an email, congratulations, you've worked asynchronously. <laughs> so so that that is one big part of, of, of uh, remote working or hybrid working, right? Figuring out what can be done asynchronously, what should be done in real time. And, and one thing that we hear time and time again is, that water cooler uh, 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 dynamic, that, that, that the informal conversations, right? And, and people feel like, yeah, if you don't have that, then you're missing out. And that's one of the things where, for example, particularly younger employees, they, they get, you know, they learn by osmosis, by being part of an of an office or a workplace, right? Uh, Andy, what, what have you learned uh, to, are, are you trying to replicate that or, or are you are you just not even worried about it? What's, what are your thoughts about this? Again, such a timely question because I had an amazingly insightful conversation on this the other day. But what we've done at Sastrify is we have, it's really simple, a virtual water cooler, which is an always open Zoom room that at any time, anyone in the company is welcome to join that Zoom room or just enter the, the room and have a conversation with anybody who's there. It's the room we use for all of our all co events, our social calls, etc. I'm also very much of the opinion that just because certain things work when we're co located, we should not force fit them into a remote environment. Things like your virtual cocktail, uh, your cocktail hour, your drinks, your team lunches, they just don't translate virtually. And trying to force fit them into a virtual environment is just uncomfortable for everyone. Like, let's just own it. There's certain things that are amazing when done in person. Just leave them there. Like, let's just not, uh, if anybody is a fan of the movie Mean Girls, then I would say at this point, let's not try not and try make Fetch happen. Fetch is not going to happen. Um, but interestingly, I had a fascinating conversation with uh, the talent director of a fully remote company that is 700 people. And she has an incredible approach to creating culture and community that I love. There are 700 people. You're not supposed to be besties with everybody at work. In fact, you don't even need to like or know everybody that you work with to make people feel connected to a business. They need a small group of colleagues who they feel connected to and they need to feel connected to the work that they're doing. 
And so what this company does as a fully remote business is they only ever have two all co-events in a year. And those are virtual events. And the rest of the time, they focus on aligning people or gathering people around the things that are interested, interesting to them. So the people who are, have pets and who are dog lovers, they have a subculture and a sub-community in their business where those people can share on Slack and connect around that. And people who located together get together for dog walks. People who are paragliding aficionados they have a sub community and a subculture for that and they don't try and force everybody into these gatherings where we can all meet people and have silly senseless small talk and high level conversations they rather focus on connecting people around the things that are inherently interesting to them and building those subcultures in a virtual environment in a remote environment and i think that's brilliant to be honest it's actually something we're going to replicate more of in Sastrify. And, you know, maybe to connect with this in terms of walking the dogs and things like that, uh, what what do you all do in terms of work-life balance or work-life integration? Is there any, any recommendations that, that you can give there? I think to come back to that theme of trust, um, this is not something that you should have to mandate for anybody. If you trust your employees, and obviously this is different in different environments, excuse me, if you have people who are time bound or on calls or shift working, different conversation. But for the most part, for your knowledge workers, let people manage their own schedules. <clears throat> excuse me. Christian, you're well aware that I have a puppy who has made herself known and present in a few of our sessions. Um, for me, it's non-negotiable that <clears throat> during the day, I can take a break, take her for a walk, go and play with the dog. And nobody's checking in on me. Nobody's saying, why aren't you responding to Slack messages immediately? Uh, I have a blocker in my calendar in the middle of the day that gives me the freedom to go and do that. And I know that I'm being trusted to get the work done because all I'm actually being measured on is, is the work being done? That's all that matters. People often say, how do we measure productivity in a remote environment? And this is baffling to me because how did you measure productivity in, an, in a co-located environment? Because bums in seats was not productivity. That was just bums in seats. Is the work being done? Plain and simple. And for me, if the work is being done, nobody really cares what time of day I'm getting it done, just provided it's getting 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 done and at a high quality on time. Yeah, that <clears throat> yes, that's a big one, right? The contract for outcomes, for results, rather than just for time spent in seats. Uh, I see Frank has a, a, another question. Also, if anyone else, Cassie, Wade, or Sam, if you guys have comments or questions, uh, please feel free to uh, to come off mute and uh, get involved here. Yes, yeah, so um, <clears throat> when I think about this water cooler thing, um, as I recall it, it was it was a little bit spontaneous. You met that you met at the water cooler because you you're going to get a, a glass of water or some coffee, and then you bumped into someone who was also there. So it was a little bit spontaneous. And I think you know the other week I met with someone and she said, uh, should, "Can I bring my dog? Should I bring my dog?" I said, "Yeah, why not?" And we had a walk and talk, and it was like you know. I think walk and talks are great for creative work. You know, you 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 uh, develop ideas together. Also, reflect reflection of of past experiences, um, and um, it, it requires, I think, a little planning. You know, you have to agree on time and space. Um, where the water cooler, it was more like we're in a, we're in a place, and and it's like more spontaneous. What what do you think about that? I love that you've brought this up because 
I think it's Darren Murph who as is one of the major proponents of remote work. He was the head of remote at GitLab, probably one of the first head of remotes out there. And he says it brilliantly. He says you should always prioritize intentionality over serendipity. And Steve Jobs famously coined the um, unintentional collisions in how he was building the Pixar and Apple campuses. He wanted people to collide with each other and have these amazing moments of creative explosion, which is great in a pipe dream, but it doesn't ever really happen that way. And so Frank, exactly what you said, I think you have to be intentional about creating these moments and these opportunities for creative collusion, let's, pull, let's call it that way. Um, we shouldn't rely on serendipity and these unintentional moments. It's, and especially not in a remote environment, you definitely can't rely on that. So intentionality is everything. What are you trying to achieve and how do you go about achieving that? So are you saying we should, we should get better or learn how to invite each other, you know, more? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. I, I love that, you know, the intentional creation of serendipity, is what I'm hearing. Sorry, Christian, we lost you for a moment there. So I didn't quite get what you said. I, I love how what I'm hearing you say is intentionally create opportunities for serendipity. Is that what you're saying? I suppose so, yes. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think one, uh, we're slowly coming to the top of the hour here. I think one, one question we also had is about developing people and talent development. And I was just kind of curious about, uh, Andy, if you had any, or also Eliza, if you had any recommendation about that. Eliza, do you want to jump in? Um, I don't have much to say there other than I think we really, from what I'm seeing, uh, what I'm hearing is that uh, leaders need some, there needs to be some more leadership training to make some of these issues that keep coming up uh, to sort of figure them out. Um, but developing people, I think we need to focus on the leaders more um, so that we can have some more buy-in on remote and hybrid and all that. That's where, that's where my brain goes when you ask me that question. So back over to you, Andy. I totally agree. I think it starts with leaders. Um, if leaders are not bought into working remotely, working asynchronously and leading by example, the business is set up for failure. Uh, I think something that's not getting enough airtime and probably needs to get enough airtime, and I don't know if this is necessarily a training need, but I'll put it as a training need because I think it's this important, is training people to switch off and disconnect from work because it is an unfortunate consequence of remote work that if your office is your kitchen, is your living room, is where you spend all of your time, it's very easy to lose those punctuation marks. You know, when... When we were commuting to the office every day, we had very solid punctuation marks in our day that started and ended our work day. And to be fair, most of us would get home, have dinner, open up our laptops and carry on working. But it's a problem that we see a lot of people not being able, not knowing how to switch off and disconnect. And I would say that if companies are dead set on investing in their employees' well-being and investing in their employee experience, giving people the skills, the tools, the know-how, and just the guidance of switching off is probably an unidentified, or as I said, a training need that's not getting enough airtime in remote work. Because 
what remote work should do is give you your freedom and autonomy back and not perpetuate a burnout culture. But if we don't focus on this, I think we do run the risk of further perpetuating a burnout culture. So what is Sastrify, what, what are you guys doing to, to make that happen? We've run campaigns around, like I call them random remote nuggets <laughs> of just ideas of how to switch off, how to disconnect. We have got lots of documentation and guidelines written, but our superpower in making this okay is our leads lead by example. Our, we have two CEOs. One of our CEOs was off and offline for a few weeks last year, as in like there were zero communications and the business still ran. Our other CEO then shortly followed suit. Our VP of people took four weeks off. She did not have Slack on her phone. She did not have Asana. She did not have Notion and she did not have her laptop with her. She was not online for four weeks. Nothing crashed and burned. The business carried on running. Our head of partnerships and reselling did the exact same thing. It was his last opportunity to take a big international trip with his family before his son started school. And he took the opportunity. And it honestly, it took a little bit of making him comfortable with being offline for so long. But we got him there. And that, I think, is our superpower in making this okay, is our leads are leading by example and showing that they can go away, be completely off, offline. One, we have brilliantly capable people who will keep the ship afloat and, and keep it going in the right direction and fast. And two, it's totally okay to do that. That psychological safety is, it's hard to, to make people feel that unless they see that in action. And what a great way to underline trust. Yep. Great. Well, froze again. Today's session. Yep, yeah, we're slowly coming to the end of today's session. Um, Andy and Eliza, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom and and your curiosity here. Uh, uh, Frank, thank you for all the great questions. Cassie, Wade, Sam, thank you for attending. Um, we have actually, let me see here. We have also a tool that you might be interested in is the hybrid work assessment tool where we actually give people feedback on how do they work as a team. We focus on hybrid teams and how do leaders actually interact with the teams and what do they do to enable the hybrid teams so that they can do really meaningful and uh, uh, you know effective work and then the next opportunity oh we have the expert our expert program that starts april 21st and and if you register until monday next monday you'll have a opportunity to get a special prize P please reach out if you're interested in that and then we have another public session on april 14th our next uh, session here is with Jake Yeager, who is a leadership coach and development uh, organizational development person at uh, the uh, Navy Credit Union, and he talks about vertical development, how you can fulfill your transformative potential in the financial industry, which hopefully is also of interest to, to many of you. And, uh, but this for next month and now thank you again, Andy and Eliza for kicking us off for this week. This has really been cool. And I hope that the audience will, um, will, you know, benefit and try some of the things that you, that you all shared here. Thanks, Christian. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks, Christian. Thanks. Thanks for being here, everyone. Thanks for your interaction. Thanks, Frank. Yes, thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. We'll see you guys around and you'll get an email from us with a link to the recording and maybe some of the highlights here of the nuggets that uh, Andy and Eliza and also the participants uh, dropped.
All right, we'll see you in the next meeting or in between sometime. Bye-bye. Thank you.